Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. Returning after an unplanned two-week hiatus, I am your host, Dusty O'Connell. Joining me, Minnesota Vikings blogger extraordinaire, well, just generally football blogger extraordinaire, uh, former live blog operator, and now slightly more peaceful person, uh, useful human, Arif Hassan. How you doing, Arif? (laughs) I'm good, I'm good. And yeah, man, live blogs, they really took a lot out of me, especially during free agency. Dude, that first day of free agency is nutso. Like, you can, I mean, not that you don't already live on Twitter, but if you ever needed a day to, that would be it. Well, I, uh, this year I, I, I took a break from, not Twitter, from TweetDeck and played Dragon Age while I looked through Twitter on my, my phone. So it was, it was a lot more relaxing. Do you use TweetDeck on your phone? No, there's no, there's no. Tweet deck app. Well, or excuse me, no. Uh, do you do you use the Twitter app, or do you use a, a different app like a, like Tweetcaster? That's the one that I use. No, I should use. I've found like two apps that are better, and I just I've always instinctively go to the Twitter app. I should use one of them. Well, it's annoying because it seems like Twitter like buys these apps and then just stops Wait, supporting just, them and lets yeah. them die. Like TweetDeck could be so much better, but there are so many new features on Twitter that it just doesn't support because it has been, I guess, officially orphaned. Yeah, no, it's 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 sad, but I mean, you can't you can't beat the TweetDeck setup, and the the fact that like you can't even view polls in TweetDeck, despite the fact that it's owned by the organization that implemented the feature. Like, what if you go to the TweetDeck website, it says TweetDeck by Twitter, which implies that they are you know still doing stuff to it, but no, the, and and it's too bad because yeah, you, like the TweetDeck interface is unparalleled for for Twitter. I would not. It makes having multiple accounts and especially having uh, Twitter lists incredibly like easy to follow. I mean, if you ever want to overwhelm yourself with information, set up a few good Twitter lists on TweetDeck. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, well, uh, as you may have guessed, this episode will feature free agency fairly heavily. Uh, we'll start with kind of some Vikings news on the uh, the free agency front and then kind of do a... Uh, a free agency roundup, such as it is, exists uh, on uh, today, which is, I guess, I guess, day two of free agency, and then uh, a couple questions in the mailbag, and that'll be it. But yeah. uh, first, I wanted to take a moment to tip our cap to Cody Whittington, a uh, previous supporter of the show, who <laughs> was drunk at his computer one night and had PayPal open and sent us a little bit of money. So uh, thank you very much for uh, performing an act which uh, we've actually been counting on, like. As James tweeted, <laughs> that you are exactly Silent. our target demographic. You know, up up late with uh, you know perhaps uh, impaired judgment and an open wallet. In a manner of speaking. Well, I mean, how much money do you think Amazon.com makes in the wee hours of the morning? Like, Wait, since they installed the one click button, oof, so much. I imagine they rely on it. Like, I'm I'm pretty sure that that will never go away, just because it would be like turning off their cash spigot. Well, I mean, corporate executives have a particular talent for that at times. But yeah, I think they're going to keep the one-click button for a while. Love it. So the Vikings have had a, a fairly standard free agency. A couple of, couple of pickups. Uh, the most notable cut was uh, Mike Wallace freeing up, uh, what, about $11 million in cap room? Yeah, $11.5 million in cap room, which... What, so the whole who they've decided to cut thing, um, none of it's been surprising because we've sort of gotten rumors for like how everything was going to play out. Um, except I suppose the rumor for Mike Wallace is that he get a renegotiated contract that he that he wouldn't necessarily get cut. But yeah, and, you know, I think it's you know just it's a, it was a good move. Period. Full stop. There's nothing that you really need to add there. Um, but what's interesting about this is that now that Marvin Jones is off the market, Mike Wallace might be one of the best free agent wide receivers on the market, which is kind of funny. 
Well, so uh, that just lends credence to the widespread belief that the Vikings are going to try to draft wide receivers fairly high or that they have, you know, value picks for a wide receiver if they are going to release who is now the best wide receiver free agency candidate. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I think that I think this is a pretty clear signal from the Vikings that they want to invest uh, multiple spots into the wide receiver position. Obviously, you know, if they could trade Cordero, maybe they would, you know, explore that option. But I think that they wouldn't. Uh, and sort of the peak for, for trading Cordero uh, has probably passed. Um, what's interesting is, you know, they didn't choose to renegotiate, or maybe they tried to renegotiate uh, Matt Khalil's cap, but they didn't choose to release him. Um, so he carries $11 million against the cap. It has now become fully guaranteed. So if the Vikings uh, want to, uh, you know, clear up that cap space, they'll, have, they'll be forced into signing a long-term extension. So if there was a bluff, it looks like Matt Khalil won. Uh, and, you know, the Vikings are not looking for left tackles in the market. looks like they've been looking maybe uh, at right tackle, and there's a couple of other offensive line uh, positions they're looking at. But for now, the only significant, um, you know, move in terms of shedding players is, is Mike Wallace, which means that the Vikings, uh, before they signed anyone new, and they've signed a couple people, uh, ended up with a little bit over $30 million, like a tiny bit over $30 million in cap space, uh, with the new cap, so not not bad, but compared to some of these other teams around the league, um, not the kind of cap space that allows you to just go go big and then also uh, fill up some reserve roles. Uh, you mentioned Matt Khalil briefly, and uh, this seems like as good a time as any to introduce a question from the mailbag from uh, Victor Pogachnik, who James stresses is no relation to him. I he's, don't believe him. He's very clear on that point. I don't know if that's just uh, if he's. If he's running away from the obvious or what. But at any rate, Victor writes in, uh, how is Khalil still employed? Does he have dirt on someone? Did he have his soul trapped in a robot suit like a purple Cyrax or Skeletor? <laughs> and if so, will that improve his blocking? Okay, A, phenomenal reference. Uh, quote, unquote, Victor. Um, if that is your real name. Because <laughs> if it's your real name, you're definitely related to James. Uh, two, um... I'm kind of confused about this, but now that there's a rumor about them going after Andre Smith, it's it's beginning to make a little bit more sense. You know, the Vikings, I think, and this is something that I've been doing when I've been talking about Matt Khalil, but I think the Vikings are doing this too, and I think this is a problem that both of us have had when it comes to evaluating Matt Khalil. So we're chasing that rookie season. I think they're chasing that rookie season. Uh, Jeff Davidson has been um, spectacularly bad at uh, developing Matt Khalil. Maybe he's been great at unlocking players like Brandon Fusco and John Sullivan, and I think that he definitely deserves credit for that. But um, you know, when it comes to Matt Lill, you know, this is not something that that Davidson can do. Uh, they brought in Hudson Hoke, uh, you know, former legendary Dallas offensive line coach. He was the guy uh, that coached up, you know, all of those you know Hall of Fame players from the Dallas offensive line in the nineties. Um, but. Uh, you know, they brought him in and Matt Clue improved, especially, you know, near the beginning of the season. Hudson wasn't with the team, you know, during the season. He was just there in the offseason as a consultant, and he was mostly consulting only about Matt Clue. So with Tony Sperano in, I think they've convinced themselves they can find Matt Clue again. They've convinced themselves that injury was a big part of the reason that he was not good in 2013 and 2014. Um, and he was an average to below average tackle, uh, you know, this last year, except for the final five games of the season. Um, and, you know, that's obviously problematic, too, because, you know, his track record is now his track record is basically maybe the last three games of the 2014 season, which, again, I think those last three games were a little bit overrated uh, from his perspective and the first like 11 or 12 games from this season. So that's a little bit less than a full season's worth over the course of two seasons of games, a stretch of play that you're counting on to get like an average tackle um, who. You're just you're kind of banking on some of the stuff from 2012, uh, and um, yeah, he's had one good year and like two really bad years, and one like probably he should have been replaced years. But like, yeah, um, that's 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 where they're at. Uh, does he have dirt? No, I think the Vikings are just kind of scared about what happens if you don't have a left tackle. I mean, I and I see a bunch of people on Twitter going like, what about Carter Bykowski? What about, you know, Austin Shepard? What about this? What about that? And I just, the the drop in play from a starting tackle, and I think Khalil showed last year that 
last year anyway, he could play at a starting tackle level. It doesn't mean good, it just means starting tackle level. The drop from a starting tackle to a backup tackle is mind blowing. It's enormous, and uh, and having that bad of a tackle on the field, um, I mean that's that's exactly what T.J. Clemmings was. And T.J. Clemmings was was miles 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 worse than Matt Khalil, uh, and to have two T.J. Clemmings uh, would be suicide for Teddy. It, the, the only reason Teddy didn't get sacked more often, I think he was sacked fifty four times this year. The only reason he didn't get sacked more often. Uh, from the right side is because they kept a tight end in pass protection almost constantly. Um, and so you can't do that when you have two bad tackles. And so the Vikings are very scared of that. I think that the optimism about a player like Herb Ikowski is massively overblown. Um, and people kind of should probably let go of that idea. I think Austin Shepard, that makes maybe a little bit more sense because he's looked good the times he's been on the field. But, you know, for the most part, I think the Vikings just have this loss aversion. They don't want to go after... Um, you know, a tackle in, in free agency on the left side. doesn't look like it would have been very easy to find one. Uh, and, um, and yeah, that, that would be the reason. Uh, I think that maybe they were a little bit too loss averse with their, you know, Matt Clill bluff, but they promised Adrian they were going to get a better offensive line. They told Teddy they were going to get a better offensive line, and sometimes that means not creating a hole uh, instead, of, instead of improving a position. So that's what that happened. Well, we did uh, re-sign Carter Bykowski to uh, a one-year contract with uh, undisclosed terms, according to Star Tribune. So probably not, you know... It's probably a minimum salary. Not $12 million. <laughs> Well, I think he's, he's an exclusive rights-free agent, so I think they automatically get to extend him if they want for a minimum salary. So, uh, so that's what we did. it's a one-year deal, it's probably the minimum salary. Uh, also re-signed Mike Harris and Andrew Sandejo to uh, excellent, I think keeps one on the, uh, the offensive side and one on the defensive side of the ball. You'll find a lot of people disagree with you about the Andrews and Deho thing. So I think Mike Harris, that was a fantastic uh, resetting. I think for Andrews and Deho, the, really, the issue with that is the amount of money involved. Um, he's only got you know one year mostly guaranteed and the other year is uh, very partially guaranteed. So it's not really a four-year deal, but you know, the average $4 million, uh, average per year is much too high for a player who is a Good backup, bad starter, uh, and and you know the, like we just mentioned earlier, the Vikings are playing with a lot of money in free agency. Sort of, everything's relative. Um, I think they needed to bring either Sandeo or Blanton back, and I figured it was going to be Sandeo because the staff consistently preferred him to Blanton when they had the opportunity to play uh, Sandeo. Um, but you know. You know, the hope is that he doesn't end up starting because there were some problems. And I think a lot of people overrated his problems. This is PFF grade. It's particularly bad. Uh, there are definitely some highlight plays where he did a really, really poor job. And I'm not saying he's a good safety, but I think people are um, a little bit too aggressive about disliking him. Um, I think that he's a starting caliber safety. And again, with Matt Khalil, again, with with uh, Andrew Sandeo, that doesn't necessarily mean good. Um, but it does mean, uh, you know, better than, uh, you know, most or all of the backups in the league. Uh, and I think that he is better than maybe most of the backups in the league. So, uh, he's a starting caliber safety ish, uh, but he's a guy that you want to replace and that kind of money that they brought in wasn't, wasn't, you know, backup level money or, or solid special teamer money, which is, you know, kind of the idea behind him is that he's a solid special teamer. Um, but it was, you know, for a lot of people, it's starter-ish money. Do you happen to know how much of his salary is guaranteed in the first year? Um, I'm taking, like I'm taking a look real quick on over the cap, but uh, it's, um, I think there's there's a decent amount in, in play incentives or in active game day checks. Let me take a look. I know she's got a roster bonus of $3 million, so that's actually fully guaranteed. A workout bonus of fifty thousand that he's almost guaranteed to hit, and a base salary of nine hundred fifty thousand. It's very, very little. It looks like in incentive incentives in the first year. So, uh, it looks like nine hundred fifty thousand dollars of it is not guaranteed, um, but those will probably come in during uh, you know game day checks and stuff like that. So, if they cut him, they would only save fifty thousand dollars against the cap. 
So uh, it, it seems like chances are pretty good that he'll stay with the team for the first year of his contract. What do you think the like percentage chances are that he stays for the three successive years? Uh, well, the next year's the next year cap number is pretty low. It's only three million, pretty low, relatively low compared to the rest of the contract. It's only three million. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if he stayed through 2017, but 2018, 2019, um, I think those odds are pretty low. Uh, none of it is guaranteed. Uh, I was actually kind of wrong about the, uh, the second year. So only the first year, uh, has, has any guaranteed money. Uh, the second year has no guaranteed money. The third and fourth year have no guaranteed money. So, um, I think this is basically, uh, a two year deal for Sendejo. Um, and the cap hits will be 4 million and 3 million. Um, still, so, you know, when the, when the contract came out, a lot of people reacted negatively to it. The contract looks better, uh, than the people's reactions. It's still, I don't think a good contract for what we want his role to be. Do you think it might be more difficult to move him after two years, given the structure of his contract? I mean, do you do you think he negotiated with the anticipation that he gets better in the next couple of years or wants to make himself more attractive to other teams? Like, No, I think the, so the problem is if he's betting on himself, he's doing a pretty poor job because they're basically all team option years. And so if he's good, the Vikings would keep him at his current salary without you know him having a bunch of leverage. I don't think he's going to get traded. Uh, if he ever becomes good enough to become a tradable asset, I think the Vikings wouldn't move him because, uh, the Vikings are unusually sensitive to the problems of having defensive back depth after all the problems they had with that between 2009 and 2011. So, um, yeah, no, I don't think that this is an example of Sandeo trying to like gamble on himself to get a better deal elsewhere. I think that, uh, he just wanted, you know, uh, the relative security of a four year deal. Um, and uh, the actual security of at least the guarantee in the first year. So it sounds like if you you know take a minute and look at it, it's actually a fairly team-friendly contract. It's more team-friendly than I think people thought, but it's still I don't think it, I don't I don't like the four million cap hit number four million for that first much. year. Yeah, so it's more team-friendly than a lot of people thought, but meh. Mm. Have we seen the last of Robert Blanton? Is he going to be somewhere yeah, else? Yeah, no, I think season? I think he's going to be somewhere else. All right. Uh, the pickup that has gotten the most attention, it seems like, on the Daily Norseman and others is guard Alex Boone from San Francisco. A uh, fairly generous contract, almost $27 million over four years. Yeah, and uh, it's a pretty exciting pickup. Um, I didn't monitor the reaction on the Daily Norseman. I mostly saw it on, uh, on Twitter, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think the reactions I saw were, were pretty appropriate as they didn't, you know, see him as, you know, a lot of people saw Mikey Potty last year uh, as like the top guard on the market. They saw him as a pretty good pickup, but not, you know, this amazing pickup. And I think that that's actually, um, I think that's probably uh, an appropriate reaction. You know, there's a lot of guaranteed money in the contract. I think there's uh, about 13.5, 13.4 million guaranteed um, and what's interesting is that almost none of it is in signing bonus. So none of that gets parsed at. So after two years, the Vikings are completely free to cut him if they want to. Um, but you know, uh, you know, the, the, the cap number all four years is $6.7 million. So it doesn't rise. It's a very easy cap to manage. It's very predictable. Uh, and he's got a roster bonus this year for 5 million and he's got his base salary, uh, half his base salary next year guaranteed. So, um, it's a, Pretty good deal, I think. Um, there's a lot, you know, to talk about when it comes to Alex Boone. Um, the there there are some issues, of course, uh, you know, with um, you know he held out in San Francisco. You know, some people uh, think that he's you know not necessarily a team player. I think that his press conference today was super funny. Uh, you know, maybe assuaged a lot of concerns that people had about him from that perspective. Um, although many people actually didn't have those concerns because a lot of people weren't even entirely aware of it. But I think that he may have even missed most of a year because of it. Either way, uh, he's kind of all over the map in terms of, you know, how good of a pickup is this? I think no one is saying that it's a bad pickup. So it's not as if, you know, there's mixed reviews in the sense of mixed reviews. But, you know, there's a lot of different sort of takes. So if you take a look at, uh, you know, the so the Bleacher Report has a top 1,000 list and they list the top 
you know, position players at every position, left guard, right guard, right tackle, wide receiver, safety, linebacker, whatever. Um, and, you know, some of those lists I don't think are very good, honestly. I think the wide receiver uh, list has some issues, but the offensive line lists are phenomenal. One of the reasons is because, uh, you know, Matt Miller is working with uh, Duke Manyweather, uh, who's an offensive line consultant, uh, and he's worked with a lot of NFL athletes. Um, it's kind of difficult to find the list of NFL athletes that he's worked with, but uh, that list definitely includes uh, Weston Richburg, who's probably the top center in the NFL after a phenomenal rookie year, or after a phenomenal sophomore year, I think. Uh, and um, and Jeff Schwartz, who you know Vikings fans know, he's pretty good when he's not injured. Uh, he's also worked with many other offensive linemen. Um, he you know helped produce this list. Uh, uh, with offensive linemen, and you know, he considered Alex Boone this last year to be the tenth best uh, left guard in the league, uh, and I think that's you know pretty phenomenal. You take a look at some of these Bleacher Report rank or, or some of these Pro Football Focus rankings. Uh, he was thirty fifth in Pro Football Focus grades this last year at left guard, thirty uh, fifth out of all guards, uh, and then he played right guard the previous three seasons, uh, and he was twentieth last year uh, or twentieth the year before rather, forty first before that, and then third. Before that, and I think a lot of people kind of remember that, um, but I think a lot of people kind of remember also that he hasn't been producing those you know dominant seasons as much anymore. Uh, you know, for for pro football focus grades, he's always been consistently producing better pass block or better run blocking grades than pass blocking grades. But statistically, and you know, the grades differ from their statistics a lot. So you know, this isn't a huge surprise. Statistically, he hasn't been that bad in terms of pass blocking efficiency. And that could be because of the, because of the mobility of the quarterback, because of the ease of his pass protection assignments, because of how, you know, defensive lines target, you know, who or whoever, because of how often he has double teams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of reasons the grades could be different than the statistics, but you know, this last year he ranked 15th in pass blocking efficiency among all guards the year before 18th and before that 34th and before that 26th. So, uh, not bad, not amazing, but certainly not bad, and definitely an upgrade over what the Vikings are used to, uh, especially at the left guard position where we had a struggling Brandon Fusco, we had Charlie Johnson uh, for a couple of years, um, all the way going back to uh, that last year uh, with Steve Hutchinson. And, you know, there's um, some pretty amazing stuff that, that I'm going to link the the Duke Manyweather report uh, in, um, in, in the show notes, but there's some pretty amazing stuff that Manyweather says – about um, uh, about sorry I'm blanking right now Alex Boone um, and uh, and I'm gonna just quote just a, a little bit of it right here um, so he calls him one of the uh, he calls him one of the best if not the best pass blockers at the guard position in the NFL based off of last year's films he has the best pass set in the league among guards he goes into a little bit of uh, of the of the technical work there. Um, but you know, the sentences that kind of stand out are like Boone displays outstanding patience and punch time. And when delivering a violent strike, he's able to latch on gaining inside control. Uh, Duke obviously had some very positive things to say about, uh, Boone's, um, you know, about Boone's run blocking. His nickname is the Rhino. He combines physicality, strength, quickness, and technique. Uh, he talks a lot about the specifics of, uh, of the different kinds of blocks that, that Boone goes into. And then he also talks about maybe a couple of times, you know, his angles to the second level are a bit inconsistent. When he takes proper angles, he's able to engage and strain flowing defenders when asked to pull. Does a decent job of digging defenders out. So those are all quotes from Duke Manyweather. I think that's very good. That's all very positive stuff to say. I would be kind of interested to see, you know, sort of how uh, he'll respond to the changes that happen in the in, in how he'll have to block uh, when he has to deal with the very, very long drops that North Turner requires of Teddy Bridgewater because you know, Colin Kaepernick would hold on to the ball for a long time, not because of the offensive design, but because of who he is. So maybe that kind of translates well, but it is a completely different offense. You don't have a moving pocket, which sometimes helps you uh, if the quarterback moves the pocket. Uh, and so, you know, so some of that is just difficult to to to, to figure out. Uh, regardless, I think it's a really good pickup. I think that the money was really good for the Vikings. Um, Chris DeMoss of the Pioneer Press said that the plan right now is to start him at left guard and that Brandon Fusco was going to compete at right guard. Um, so that'll be fun. I thought that was a great pickup. That's probably um, going to highlight what ends up being a positive free agency period uh, for the Vikings. Obviously, you know, they'll probably sign a couple more players by the time, uh, you know, this is all gets played out. But, you know, most of the moves have been made. Most of the moves I kind of disagree with. But even with all of that, I think that grabbing Alex Boone 
um, is one of, of many steps the Vikings are going to make along the offensive line that make this a net positive. So even if all the individual signings, even if they add up to, you know, I dislike more of the signings than I like, I think that the addition of Alex Boone is just so good for the Vikings that uh, is it's just a positive for Asian period overall. It's a good contract. He's had some issues. Um, he's either an average guard, according to Pro Football Focus, and that's kind of the floor of his evaluations, or he's an incredibly good guard, uh, according to Duke Manyweather, um, who isn't evaluating sort of the results kind of like Pro Football Focus does. You know, did he get blocked? Did he allow a pass rusher through? And he's evaluating the technique here, which uh, may be more sustainable, who knows. Um, so getting somewhere between an average to an extremely good guard, somewhere in between, uh, is going to be nice. He's a versatile run blocker. He can block in any number of schemes. He's had to do it in San Francisco. He's had to block in zone. He's had to block in man. He's had to block in hybrid schemes. And so that'll fit well here in Minnesota as well with the man blocking scheme that, uh, that Tony Sperano is likely to implement. And he is a 100% hard ass, as is evidenced by the extremely popular gif floating around of him unhelmeted headbutting a helmeted Colin Kaepernick <laughs> yeah. and clearly making an impression on the golden garbage can. Yeah, no, he's, um, he's, he's fun, right? So he's not just an unmitigated hard ass. He hates Clay Matthews, right? You know, that, good, that speaks well to him. I think yeah, among thumbs up fans. plus one. Uh, he, he did, he was asked about it. He did say that he thinks, you know, Clay Matthews is a good guy, but we'll ignore that for now. Um, he did say he hates Clay Matthews. So there's that. Well, he didn't say he hates him. He said he wants to punch him in the face. So that's done. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, he's really charismatic in in the uh, in the in the presser today, today as of this recording, rather. Uh, and you know he's you know talking about you know uh, as soon as he heard Minnesota was interested, he wanted to go to Minnesota, freeze out all the other teams. I want to play in the cold. Uh, he grew up in Ohio watching the NFC North, actually, and he says that he loves NFC North football. To him, it was always, you know, nasty, bruising football, and he wanted to be part of that. Minnesota's building that. It seems like Minnesota's really close, he said, uh, and he wants to be a big part of that. Um, you know, as soon as he met Teddy, you know, he loved him and he wants to protect him. He's his quarterback. Uh, he's, he didn't just say all the right things. He just, it was very effusive, and it was really cool. It was kind of fun. Yeah, now that uh, Jared Allen has ridden off into the sunset, it'll be nice to have another player who can provide uh, pithy quotes, basically uh, on demand for for media members. Yeah, Tomasin predicted that he was going to get the uh, media good guy award, so we'll see if we'll see if prognosticating Tomasin is going to is going to bear that one. He's he's going to he's going to move the needle a little bit because he gets a vote. But. You wouldn't call that uh, Tomastigating, would you? I would call it Tomastigating. Ah, excellent. Uh, so we had a question from James Reed in the email mailbag about Raheem Moore, but it seems that the Vikings went in a different direction and signed Michael Griffin instead. Uh, yeah. Um, by the way, sorry for uh, for not getting to some of the mailbag stuff from the last time. Uh, by well, the way, we just wanted Logan to wait Reed. until we had a firm answer for that question, and then the Vikings <laughs> took care of that for us. So now uh, we don't have to speculate. <laughs> exactly. Uh, by the way, that's Logan Reed. Uh, oh, that's right. The, the, the email always. We so messed Logan that up constantly. Reed. Sorry, Logan. Sorry. Um, anyway, Logan. But, but uh, yeah, they saw Michael Griffin. This is one of the moves that I talked about when I said that I disagree with some of the moves that the Vikings have made. Um, 33 old. Um, his biggest asset when he was, uh, you know, he's a first round pick, right? The, his biggest asset when he was with Tennessee, when he was good, uh, you know, basically, you know, 2000. 2007 is when he had a huge interception season, I think, but it was 2008 to kind of 2012 that he was that he was pretty good. I uh, got two Pro Bowls in that span of time. I think one in 2010 and one in 2009, if I'm remembering correctly. I could be wrong. could be one in 2008. Either way, uh, his biggest asset then was his speed, and that's clearly fallen off. He doesn't really have uh, the, same, the same speed. Uh, and, you know, there's definitely a very clear – tendency among the kinds of players the Vikings are signing and re-signing in the secondaries. They all love to hit hard. They all have a history of hitting hard. They all have good gifts of them hitting hard. Uh, they set the tone for the defense. It's very clearly a theme that the Vikings are setting, and Michael Griffin kind of adds to that theme. Unfortunately, unlike Harrison Smith and more like Andrew Sandeo, uh, you know, Griffin's had some problems in you know, wrapping up. And I think that 
his missed tackle problem is overstated. You know, Pro Football Focus had a tweet saying that, you know, he has the most missed tackles for a safety since 2007 when they started grading. And that sounds really bad. And I'm not going to say it's not bad. It's bad, but I think it's overblown. It's not that he's the worst safety at tackling since 2007. Those are the safeties just happened to get cut or benched. Uh, and, you know, Griffin wasn't. Uh, and so he's had a lot more tackle opportunities. If you take a look at his tackling efficiency, pro football focus, a premium stat that they keep, how many tackles you get per missed tackle, um, he actually has two pretty good seasons in that span of time, kind of top 10. And most of the other seasons are relatively average to a little bit below average. And I think that's more who he is. He's missed more tackles recently than he has, uh, than he had back in you know, 2009 or whatever. Um but it is an issue of his. He's not an incredibly good tackler. He's not a very good tackler. Um, and it's against it's against players who are generally easier to tackle. When he goes up against a running back, he's had some more problems, you know, uh, you know, bringing a tackler down. And he's been juked out of space. There's a good gif of him getting just rocked out of his shoes by Le'Veon Bell, uh, just deking him out. But um, he's got a tackling problem. I think that it's overstated. Uh, he had a high interception total one year. He hasn't been able to maintain that. He drops a lot of his interceptions, and I think that he's a little bit late to react. Uh, and I don't see him as the kind of player that can man up against tight ends, uh, not only because he's lost that speed, but because he's just really much more used to you know the zone style of play where he gets to go downhill. Um, I do think that he is relatively versatile to the degree that you can expect someone that I think is limited in some serious ways to be versatile. So I think that, you know, cause the Vikings really want a player that can be both a strong safety and a free safety so that he and Harrison Smith can rotate roles and be a really diverse multiple defense in a way that makes it very difficult for quarterbacks and offensive coordinators to figure out what they need to do. Uh, and in that sense, I think that you're not losing much by moving him from free safety to strong safety or back. Whereas I think you were, if you did that back in 2009, um, I think that, his tackling issues are an issue at either strong safety or free safety. I think that, you know, a lot of people expect strong safeties to be better tacklers, and I understand that. Um, but his tackling angles aren't bad. They're not great, but they're not bad. Uh, and, and I think that's probably more important for the strong safety position uh, relative to the free safety position uh, because of the role that they play in the run, in, in run defense. And I think that, you know, your ability to tackle is probably equally important at either safety position in terms of completing those tackles. Um I don't know. It's just not a great signing, but it's also not a bad contract. Uh, it's like a one-year contract. It's not for very much. Um, Sandeo is actually making more in this first year, so whether or not uh, he's even going to be on the roster come you know August, you know who knows. Uh, it could be sort of like uh, a Kirk Coleman kind of deal, or uh, you know the Vikings brought in um, a safety. Was it Jim Leonard? They brought in a safety for like a week. Uh, in training camp one year that that had worked with Mike Zimmer. I, I really think it was Jim Leonard, but I Googled it once and I couldn't find it. Um, and uh, and they were just there to help teach the defense. Um, so that's probably not what that is, but I think that you don't want to overstate the fact that because this guy was a pro bowler that he's going to make the team uh, because those days are long past. Still not a great move. Uh, I think that there were a bunch of moves at safety they could have made. Um, or could still make that are a lot more interesting. I'm not saying they were necessarily in the running for players like Deshaun Gibson, who played hurt last year, or Rodney McLeod, who um, you know I think he signed. Uh, he, I think he signed somewhere uh, in the Northeast. You know, one of those Eastern Seaboard teams. Uh, and uh, and I know Deshaun Gibson signed with I think Jacksonville. Uh, so I'm not saying that they could have signed either of those two, but I think you know those two were were maybe on the market. If you're going to sign an old guy. You know, might as well break the bank and see if you can get Eric Weddle. It sounds like Eric Weddle wants to stay in the AFC. He's going with four teams right now. One of them is the Raiders. We don't know who they're going to be. Um, but I think that out of all of these other options at safety, and there's still a couple more that are inside, out of all of these other options at safety, I think the Vikings could have made uh, better, more significant deals, even if they wanted to, you know, draft a safety to eventually be the starter, or if, even if they wanted Anthony Harris to win the starting job, uh, which is still a possibility, of course. Um, so... Yeah, I don't. I don't see that Michael Griffin adds that much value, even though he's better than probably most camp bodies at safety. All right, and he's taking a fairly significant pay cut to come play for the Vikings. He would have been. Uh, he would have had a six and a half million dollar base salary if he had stayed with the Titans. And now, really? even if he gets all of his incentives, he will be paid about three million. 
That's stunning. I can see why they let him go. Huh. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, but like, whew. Uh, A couple of big moves at linebacker. Should Chad Greenway fear for his job after the signings of Travis Lewis and Emmanuel Lamer? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good segue to talk about the two linebacker signings. Um, so a couple of teams, according to Derek Wolfson, have inquired, or Ben Gessling, one of the two, have inquired uh, about uh, about Chad Greenway, uh, or to Chad Greenway, rather, because uh, he's a free agent. Uh, and the Vikings want him back, too, uh, as of the last time they checked. Now, I don't know if the last time they checked was before or after the Vikings signed two linebackers, but I think that this is not going to significantly impact uh, Chad's chances of re-signing with the Vikings. First, I think that Travis Lewis is going to compete with a seventh-round linebacker for a special teams job. I think that he's going to be a backup linebacker in name only or in desperation circumstances. Um, I don't see him moving Edmund Robinson off the roster. I think the better question is whether or not Brandon Watts is, uh, you know, is is threatened than if Chad Greenway is not going to be able to get a second contract because of him. Lewis, according to Lions fans, is actually a very poor linebacker, but a pretty good slash solid special teamer. Um, the Vikings have been building a, a linebacking core who's, you know, who's, whose setup is to be really good at special teams. Um, so, you know, I think Lewis affects it. Uh, Lemur, maybe. Um, I think that, uh, you know, so he's played both the weak side linebacker position, which is now Chad's role, and the strong side linebacker position, Anthony Barr's role. Uh, in the Cincinnati defense, he's played uh, a ton of their nickel snaps last year. I think he played about 40% of their snaps. The year before that, he played yeah, over 80%, like an enormous amount. Um, so uh, there was that, but he's not very good. <laughs> um, he's a great athlete, um, but he's just not necessarily all that great of a, of a football player. He's like kind of one of those, um, you know, he's actually one of the reasons I thought the Vikings would go after an undersized weak side linebacker. They instead went after a sort of undersized middle linebacker. Um, but, you know, he's like 230 pounds, I think. He runs a pretty fast 40. Um, but, you know, there's, there's some issues. I mean, aside from, um, you know, his, his pro football focus grade, which is not super complimentary. Last year, he was 65th. The year before that, he was 89th of 94 linebackers. Um, he, yeah, it's, it's not great. Um, he's an okay tackler at times. He's a bad tackler at other times. Uh, for the most part, I would say he's probably an okay tackler. His, his ability to wrap up and bring down the ball carrier is all right, but he doesn't bring as much. Uh, to bear. He doesn't bring as much force with them uh, when he tackles as even actually as Michael Griffin, who's about 201 pounds, um, as opposed to, you know, him, he's 235 pounds. Uh, he's not a big hitter. Um, so he doesn't have a lot of stopping power and sometimes he'll require some help, which he, you know, helps provide by slowing down the, the ball carrier. Um, but, you know, he, he just doesn't get off blocks very well. Um, and he gets overpowered pretty easily. You know, there's some some guys who are relatively undersized that can find ways to slip blocks or use leverage to get away from blocks or whatever. Uh, and, you know, Chad used to be that guy. I think Kendricks can be that guy. He had some issues with that this year, but, you know, showed some flashes. And it looks like Lemur is never going to be that guy. Uh, so once once a defender gets to him, I think that's kind of it for him in the run game. Uh, so I think Chad might actually be, you know, as much as I bag on him, uh, might actually be better, at him, better than Lemur in the run game as it stands right now. Uh, despite, you know, Chad's age and, and and the speed issues that he has that Lemur does not. In coverage, Lemur's a lot better, but I still don't think that he's an above average coverage defender. It's just that he's relatively better in coverage. I think that despite I think he's got pretty good agility scores, if I remember correctly. Despite that, he's not that agile in coverage. He's a little bit too tentative in zone coverage in terms of, you know, attacking players underneath. Um, he doesn't click, he doesn't react as well to the ball in the air, which is why he's a little bit late in zone coverage. He's a little bit stiff, uh, in, uh, in man coverage. And I think that he kind of loses his guy sometimes where he loses the, the beat of what's happening. Very familiar with the scheme. Um, but it just doesn't seem like he's a player who's kind of integrated football technique into how he plays. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Vikings re-signed Chad and Chad is ahead of Lemur on the depth chart, but Lemur is a a more versatile backup because he's played, you know, both outside linebacker positions for Mike Zimmer in the past. So it's more of like a, a 
adding depth sort of situation than potentially looking for a replacement. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if like, hey, the Vikings think they've got enough depth and they don't sign Chet. So I wouldn't be surprised if it impacted his chances. I just don't think that it's likely that it impacted his chances, but it could. I just don't think it did. Speaking of adding depth, uh, if you want to see a really unflattering picture of Andre Smith, uh, <laughs> check out the Daily Norseman article where it looks like he is... Is that uh, him running the 40? Uh, no, it's uh, it's him lined up in a game against the Browns, but uh, like you, you see him and he's got his eyes on his defender, but it looks like his very large body is about to like collapse both of his ankles and his knees. Oh wow! I just saw it, and yes, it it definitely. <laughs> that is not a uh, a football move that he is making right there. Well, I think the photographer caught him in the in the middle of a kick step or. That has to be it because it looks like he's chopping back. Yeah, it, uh, it looks like he's trying to scoot, you know, to his, I guess, yeah. right to to pick up ninety seven, yeah. and he's like pushing back off of his like left heel. But yeah, not a not a good moment to be photographed. Yeah, uh, he should probably be pushing off of his toes. Honestly, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andre Smith is kind of interesting just because, uh, aside from like, being big, he's a big name. Um, I. I just, I guess for the purposes of adding starting quality bodies to compete with each other uh, for offensive line spots, I suppose that would make sense. I don't see him signing with Minnesota. I know he's visiting Minnesota. I know that there's this Mike Zimmer connection, but I think that he'd rather be assured of a chance to start. And I think there's a couple of places around the league that he'd be able to start if he chose to visit them uh, as opposed to, um, as opposed to, you know, being required to compete for a job. Uh, You know, Andre Smith, um, you know, somebody that I think that people kind of overrate his run blocking ability because of how big he is and how long he's been with the Bengals. Um, you know, overall, I I feel like he doesn't consistently. Well, there's two things he doesn't consistently do. I think the first thing is that he doesn't consistently drive with his feet. You know, a lot of the, a lot of people talk about how Lundell's a really good run blocker, and a lot of people kind of naturally attribute that to his size and his strength. Obviously, those are big aspects to, to how Lodeholt does things. Andre Smith also has size and strength. Maybe not as much as Phil Lodeholt, but you're kind of splitting hairs there. Uh, he is bigger and stronger than almost everybody he lines up against, kind of like Phil Lodeholt. But the difference, I think, is that you know Lodeholt will drive. And, uh, and you know a lot of people don't see that in Lodeholt because um it looks like he'll he'll get his feet stuck in cement or because he doesn't move very well in pass protection um but you know for the most part load holt will drive and and he'll move, he'll move his feet to do it uh andre smith doesn't do that and 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 that creates some problems it allows defenders to squeeze the gap and then at the second level he's also inconsistent uh in his blocking angles and so he'll misses uh he'll miss his uh he'll miss his defender uh, and he's supposed to be a better run blocker than a pass protector. And if you take a look at the PFF grades, uh, I think he was 64th last year in PFF out of 76. Uh, before that, 52nd. Before that, 24th. And before that, 6th. So precipitous fall every single year. Uh, and this is why I mentioned uh, Andre Smith when I was talking about Max Lill, is that the Vikings might be chasing one good year uh, and ignoring two to three bad uh, years and, and well, taking bad, a progressive like an average. Worse. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it's, I get it because you think you can fix someone and, and all that. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think that he's actually a lot like a lot of people imagine Lodeholt to be uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but I think worse. I don't think there's ever been a year where I would consider Maybe maybe that 2012 right where where he was sixth in PFF grades. Maybe if I compared the two uh, in terms of their film in 2012, Lodo would have been better. But my guess is I wouldn't. I couldn't find a single year, except obviously last year when Lodo didn't play, where Lodo wasn't a better right tackle than Andre Smith. And they're kind of comparable in the sense that the way that people perceive Phil Lodo in about 2010, his sophomore year in the NFL, is kind of like how Andre Smith plays now. Andre Smith's not very quick in pass protection, didn't move his feet well. And unlike Lodeholt, he hasn't really figured out how to compensate for that. And I think Lodeholt has. I think that, uh, you know, what Phil does is that he finds a way to get the first push in, which is why he struggles a little bit with wider defenders because it's harder to get 
that push in uh, when they're lined up a little bit at wide. But he's figured out that first contact is a way for him to win and get over some of the agility issues he has on the edge, whereas Andre Smith hasn't really figured that out, and he still kind of struggles with edge defenders. Um, there's that. I think Lodehold has a little bit better balance. Uh, and um, and so what we what we talk about when we say Lodehold's a bad, a bad pass protector, which I don't think is entirely accurate or fair, is kind of what Andre Smith has been for the past two or three years. So I'm not super excited. It doesn't seem like Vikings fans are incredibly excited, but they're intrigued because it is something. Andre Smith is a starting quality right tackle. Uh, and so you have him, you have Lodholt, who admittedly hasn't played something like 20 games, uh, the last 20 games. Um, and, you know, you're going to have a really good backup between the two of them, but you probably don't have anyone that could flip inside to guard and, I mean, we already have a pretty healthy competition at right guard anyway between Fusco and Harris. Obviously, you're not going to ask Lodeholt or Smith to play left tackle. Obviously, you're not going to ask them to play center. So um, it is. it would be an interesting allocation of resources. If I'm Andre Smith, I'm going to find a team that wants me to start. Um, because, you know, I think his reputation is better than his play, and I think some teams will bank on his reputation. Well, there you go. And that uh, that about wraps up the uh, Vikings free agency moves. There's a Star Tribune article linked in the show notes, the Vikings free agent tracker that is updated with the latest in uh, re-signings, additions, losses, players released, who I don't anticipate there'll be anyone at, well, I guess maybe Josh Robinson, but uh, of the unsigned free agents, uh, do you imagine that most of them will come back for next season? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised most of them came back. I think Asiata came back, question mark? I don't remember. Um, but yeah, uh, I think aside from Robinson, I think that most would be expected to come back. Well, then let us turn our attention to the rest of the league, starting with a story that blew up the entire internet and then crept on to uh, Fox Sports and ESPN for about five minutes. The uh, The great Uncle Chaps, who uh, <laughs> amazing if we're if we're being completely clear so uh uncle chaps tweeted out that uh uh who was it olivier vernon was signed by the giants jaguars, jaguars. Uh, he ended up going to the giants uh later that day <laughs> but uh fox sports picked up this tweet as though it was actual reportage and then uh espn picked it up too and yeah uh, so chaps pretended to be jake laser so the thing about chaps is that He's not like most fake accounts when they fake a thing. First, all you have to do is go through Chaps' feed because he tweets about not this stuff all the time. Uh, um, he, he doesn't tweet in character. He's not like a, he's not a fake account in the vein of like an Adarn Schefter. Right, exactly. Uh, and he doesn't change his at. Right, it's just it's at Uncle Chaps every single time. He just changes the name that appears, uh, and he changes his avatar, and that's it. And so he was Jay Glazer this time, uh, and uh, and he he tweeted out that the Jaguars signed Olivier Vernon to like a four year seventy five point five million deal, which you know the people who thought it was real were like, wow, that's a pretty expensive deal. It turns out they got a way better deal anyway with the Giants. <laughs> it turns out but reality yeah. was much more ludicrous, yeah. And then ESPN cited it. The th- weird thing is that ESPN cited it as Jay Glazer, uh, which is actually kind of rare. They actually don't cite Jay Glazer when he breaks news. They just say according to reports, which Glazer's had some issues with, a lot of issues with, actually, in the past, because ESPN doesn't cite the fact that he's the one that's breaking the news. It's kind of his only job. Uh, and so the one time they did do it, it wasn't actually him. It was Uncle Chaps. Um, and this is why they don't. <laughs> well, <and laughs> this, this is why, damn it. This is why we can't have nice things. Well, and what kills me is that uh, – the ESPN you know, was like, oh, this is a fake account. It's a fake account. You know, we were duped by a fake account. And it's like, well, no. I mean, the at was still the same. The at was still Uncle Chaps, you know. And, he, and like you said, all you had to do is take one look at his feed and you would know that he was not a Jay Glazer impersonator. He was just a guy who wanted to prank the crap out of sports media and successfully did it. <laughs> so I got a kick out That's of that. So fun. Yeah, he got... Uh, the at NFL account to retweet him once. And we thought that was kind of the peak chapsing moment. Uh, and he just, he just does this and totally redeems himself. Hello, ESPN. 
Bill Barnwell, uh, turning away from that, Bill Barnwell has a, an excellent ongoing free agency roundup where he kind of ranks or, or uh, rates all of the free agency pickups by uh, like on, on a letter grade scale, basically. And uh, there, there are a lot of C's. Barnwell does not seem terribly impressed with free agency so far this year. Yeah, I noticed that when, when you sent me the link. It's I was actually looking for an A. I finally found an A. Uh, I already forgot. I think it was the Charles Do- Johnson re-signing by the Panthers for a super cheap deal. Um, so there's there was the A. There was a B plus or two in there. But it was mostly C's, which, you know, if you called him out on that, he'd be like, well, average is average and C's are average. And I don't believe in grade inflation, which I agree with. But I think that he still is over-representing. If you put all of his grades on a bell curve, there would be way too many C's. So... Uh, I guess teams have been particularly terrible this year. Some of the C grades are kind of head scratchers. He said the Derek Johnson deal was a C plus, for example, and um, and he was like, because 2015, you know, he got a Pro Bowl. That's it's true, he's a Pro Bowl linebacker, but it was more of like you know a name or a sympathy or whatever Pro Bowl because he was on a good defense. That's not really true. Derek Johnson played out of his mind this year, um, and I understand his point that the end of his deal, uh, I think through two years, it's guaranteed. At the end of his deal is going to be 35. Um, so I get his point, but whatever, man. I think that's a B plus signing for sure. I mean, he's one of the best linebackers in football. He's probably going to be one of those next year, and he's probably going to fall off the year after that or the year after that. In which case, he probably made a good deal. So whatever. But still, uh, there are some interesting. He, I think, he overgraded. Uh, I think that he he was too generous in giving the Texans a, a B plus for Brock Osweiler, for example. Ooh, I, I concur with that. Uh, the like he, he talks about how uh, Houston may have dodged a bullet and won't have to give up a draft pick to get a, uh, an acceptable quarterback. But his own uh, stat line comparison between Brock Osweiler and Brian Hoyer in 2015 kind of gives the lie to his own argument. Like if they were... I mean, if the Texans were looking for another mediocre quarterback, then the stat line would indicate that they have found one. Yeah, it was a really weird argument that Barnwell made is that he was like, well, he's basically identical to Brian Hoyer, which I don't know if I ever want to start an argument like that. Is, is that, is that good? Like, what is <laughs> what are we going for here? <laughs> right? But his argument is that, you know, Hoyer's old and, and Osweiler's young. And not only is Osweiler young, he's got some tools that Hoyer never had, uh, which is that he's got a good arm uh, and that he could develop. And I think that, I think that one... I think, and I know that this is kind of Barnwell's deal because, like, you know, subjectivity brings up a lot of room for error. Um, And so, you know, the statistics, uh, you know, would be easier to evaluate. But I think that here Barnwell is being subjective about his projection for improvement, and he's not admitting it. Um, he, He just quickly makes the claim that he believes that Osweiler has a higher ceiling than Hoyer, which... You know, it seems reasonable, but it would be nice to know, like, in what way and why. Right, and really, all we had was big arm, and that's that's a subjective thing. And I think that from a scouting report perspective, I think that Brock Osweiler actually falls flat. I think if you look at the stats, I think that what is he a third year quarterback, a fourth year quarterback, right? Uh, a fourth year quarterback should do better than that. Um, I'm not going to compare him to Aaron Rodgers, but he is probably one of the only examples we have of a guy coming off of the bench. Uh, for a Hall of Famer after four years and then becoming a starting quarterback. Uh, maybe Tyrod Taylor is another example. Maybe that's who we should compare him to. Uh, Tyrod Taylor looks a lot better than, um, than than Osweiler. I mean, a lot of people might disagree uh, with the following statement, but I think that he may have looked like a top eight quarterback this last year. Uh, Bills fans actually disagree, and they watched him more than me, so they may know better. Uh, you know, their issue, of course, is that, you know, he didn't produce in the clutch or he didn't produce when teams knew he was going to throw. I actually kind of disagree with that, but whatever. The point is that if you don't, if you, if you sit for four years and if you don't produce better than Brian Hoyer's statistics, because I think those are actually probably maybe a little bit worse than Brian Hoyer's statistics, given how friendly uh, the field was for him in terms of like field position and uh, and scoring opportunities and stuff like that. Not that the Texans didn't have a decent defense at times last year, although at other times they didn't. Um, it was just you know he had he had better and more ample opportunities 
uh, despite having maybe a worse receiving core, uh, to produce better statistics than, than Hoyer, and he didn't. And I think that you kind of exhaust your potential to talk about upside uh, in that context. And I think that if you take a look at, uh, you know, Osweiler subjectively, there are a lot of problems to his game. I think that he's still late in diagnosis. He still has a lot of problems in terms of like identifying blitzes and identifying defenses. And actually one of the bigger issues in terms of his pre-snap reads isn't necessarily identifying blitzes, although he still has issues with that. It's that he very often cannot figure out what kind of coverage a defense is running. Uh, And as a result, the coverage that he thinks that they're running is the one that he'll throw against. Uh, as opposed to the one that they're actually running. So a receiver that is supposed to be open against, you know, cover two zone, uh, he's actually, you know, he's actually going to be quite covered up well in like, you know, a cover six man or something like that, you know, half quarters, half, uh, half, you know, cover two. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a result, um, you know, he'll throw into tight coverage or he'll throw, um, you know, in areas where, you know, it's not going to work out for him. And I think that he was kind of lucky in terms of interception rate this last year. There probably should have been more. Um, He's accurate when he does make the right read, but he's a second late and he doesn't always anticipate or, or, uh, or, you know, move the offense or, or, or make the offense change in response to what he's seeing. Uh, You know, he's, he's more mobile than he's given credit for. A lot of these tall quarterbacks uh, are kind of like that where people kind of assume they're not mobile. It's a little bit more mobile than he's credit for, uh, gives credit for, but he's, he kind of obviates that with iffy uh, understanding of pressure and iffy footwork uh, and that creates problems for him. So I, I don't, I don't know what Barnwell's talking about, man. Like I know that statistically you could make a case if you have a subjective interpretation of those statistics but I think that a straight look at those statistics is not favorable to him. And I think that in terms of a subjective look at, at things, uh, it's more favorable to the idea that this was a bad plan instead of a good plan. Probably should have taken a shot at someone who has definitely a better ceiling. Um, and, um, and we know that they haven't reached their potential because they're a rookie. And look at one of those four passers at the top of the draft, whether it's like Goff or, or Lynch or Wentz or uh, the other one, whoever it is. I don't have it here in front of me. I mostly just wanted to uh, highlight the uh, the article so that people could uh, take a look at it and uh, feel free to yeah. accuse Barnwell oh. of great inflation given the number of Bs and B pluses that are also... <laughs> Well, great deflation for the C's, great inflation for the B's, and I think we're good because there are no D's. So there's definitely great inflation. No, there's, there's only one A, so there's great deflation. There's a D. There's, uh, there's one D. There's Who, who's the, well, there's two if you include trades, right? Yes. So now let's go on and talk about perhaps the most ridiculous contract thus far in free agency. I think uh, Olivier Vernon is probably near the top of that discussion, but actually Brock Osweiler makes a pretty compelling argument too. Well, okay, so the thing I wanted to say but forgot to say is I think – so we've been talking about this for maybe the last three years in the podcast is that we kind of wanted to see what happened when a meh quarterback hit the market, one who seems to be clearly starting quality um, to a lot of people. not Maybe not everybody, obviously not me, um, but who seems to be starting quality to a lot of people. Not John Elway. Um, Maybe John Elway. I mean, they did offer him a contract. Who knows? I mean, I guess, but you know, I I think Brock was still uh, sore over being benched in week seventeen. Yes, I think I think that's exactly what happened. Um, but yeah, so so Andy Dalton Light hits the market. Not that their strengths and weaknesses really match each other, but you know, a Met quarterback hits the market. Obviously, Andy Dalton turned it around last year and became more than average, much more than average. But you know, say one of these you know Met quarterbacks hits the market, people think he's starting quality. But no one ever expects him to go to a Pro Bowl. He's the definition of quarterback purgatory, right? Um, what happens? You know, like you, we see, you know, Andy Dalton get this incredible deal after three best seasons. We saw Colin Kaepernick get a deal that had a lot of money in it that was actually structured a lot friendlier to the team than we thought. You know, we saw Joe Flacco get another deal. He might, he might be the highest paid quarterback again, right? We see these incredible deals, right? Deals where quarterbacks get to build money forts out of, right? And we're just like, these these quarterbacks are just not that good. Um, but what happens if they hit the market? Because they were all re-signed before they get hit the market. We finally saw what happened when they hit the market. That 
Yeah. So 37 million guaranteed. Yeah. So uh, that's not as ridiculous to me because we kind of were waiting for it to happen. Olivier Vernon, was he the highest paid defensive end right now? That's ridiculous. I know if I'm Everson Griffin or Sharif Floyd right now, I am, uh, I'm maybe just driving by the Maserati dealership a little more slowly, you know? Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, $52.5 million guaranteed, $85 million over five years for somebody who they are functionally banking on having like a crazy high ceiling, right? Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, well, so the thing with Olivier Vernon is that he had a high sack toll this last year. Um, of course, that's on the same line as Cameron Wake and Adam Kung Su. Not that Cameron Wake played at the level that you know he played at two years ago, but he was still pretty good. Um, he had a high sack total this year, sort of. He had seven and a half sacks. Um, and and they're kind of just paying... I mean, he, and he's only 25. He's going to be 26, I think, when the season... Oh, no, he's, he's actually going to be 25 when the season starts. So, I mean, Linval Josephy in terms of in terms of the in terms of finding a free agent. So he's young. But um there's a really good article I'm gonna link in the show notes uh about Olivier Vernon. Uh it's from at NFL Film Study. Uh he's Ian Wharton. He's been on the show once I think. He's done some pretty fantastic work. He's also a Dolphins fan, so he talks about the Dolphins a lot. Uh and the distinction that he makes about the kinds of pass rushers that are is that you know there's facilitators. Uh, and uh, and then there's like playmakers. And so uh, Joey Bosa, for example, one of the worries that he has is that Joey Bosa is going to get a lot of pressures but not a ton of sacks because he might be a facilitator instead of a playmaker. Somebody who can flush someone into a sack, not necessarily a good finisher. And I think Minnesota fans know Brian Robinson to be this guy. He's led the league in pressures over the course of multiple three-year spans, right? He has a ton of pressures, never a ton of sacks. Um, and that's good to have. You want to have facilitators because you can't, you you won't have enough money to get enough playmakers for all four positions on the line. First, second, they're very very difficult to find. Uh, and third, facilitators might be able to increase your defensive line's overall productivity more than, uh, you know, so like two facilitators and two playmakers may be able to increase your productivity more than you know four playmakers might because there might be a lot of you know freelancing and stuff like that. Who knows? But the point is, you know, you can create these distinctions. Uh, you know, Brian Robison is that, and he thinks that Olivier Vernon is that. And that a lot of the sacks that he got over the past couple of seasons um, were were really long sacks. It took a lot of time, either because of coverage or because protection broke down and he got to chase down the quarterback, not necessarily because of anything that he did himself, or he got open on a stunt or something like that. Um, and, and because of that, you know, you're asking him to do something and you're paying him a lot to do something that he isn't necessarily great at. So no one's saying that he's a bad defensive end, but he's certainly not like the highest paid defensive end good. Not all. the best ever. Right. Like. So, yeah. So like, and I'll, I'll, link, I'll link the Bleach Report piece because if even if you disagree with it, it's really good. It, it introduces a concept really well and it's really good uh, food for thought. But, you know, for the most part, I mean, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you can... You don't have to like pay the, that much for him. Exactly. I feel like the Giants are going to wake up in like three or four months with a really brutal free agency hangover. Like they're going to go to their wallet where there used to be lots of money and then there isn't going to be any money there. And they're going to be like, well, I guess this is our team. How did, how did that happen? I don't remember any of this. <laughs> uh, so the, the jury is out, I guess, on Olivier Vernon and, and whether or not he can justify the gigantic contract he got. But I think uh, two honorable... Well, hey, let's actually talk about another giant signing that was super confusing, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, Damon Harrison, you know, nose tackle for the Jets, former nose tackle for the Jets, signed with the Giants. Now, I thought, you know, he hits the market, and, you know, the Vikings didn't need him because they've got Linval Joseph. Um, but I thought, you know, just generally speaking, he'd be a fantastic pickup for a team that needed, uh, you know, a run-blocking defensive tackle. Right, a guy you can plug holes and you can eat up blocks and you can even make the tackle for loss mm-hmm. uh, by splitting double teams. Fine, he's really good um, for a team that needs one. The Giants already have a really good run blocking two down nose tackle in Jonathan Hankins, and they spent like eight and a half million dollars, something like that, per year, and getting Damon Harrison. To basically play the same role. And I understand, you know, a lot of Giants fans are like, well, Jonathan Hankins is a really underrated pass rusher when he was on the field, uh, you know, because he missed a lot of 2015. When he's on the field in 2014, he was really good at rushing the passer. 
And that might be true, right? But like Linval Joseph for the Giants was a really good pass rusher from a one technique position. But we wouldn't ask Linval Joseph to rush the passer from the three technique position. And I don't think the Giants would be very smart to ask Jonathan Hankins to rush the passer from the three technique position because that requires a lot more quickness and it requires a little bit more speed and a little bit more agility because you don't have a direct line of the quarterback. You're a little bit wider. You're not defensive end wide, but you're a little bit wider because you're between the guard and the tackle. And you're going to be asked to stunt a lot more. Uh, and, and you're, you know, th- there's a lot of reasons that, you know, it's not the same rushing from the three technique position. Just ask Warren Snap, uh, Sapp how three techniques are different than one techniques. Uh, he did very poorly as a one technique in, in Oakland. Uh, and so they signed Jonathan Hagan. So they have two really good two down guys. And I have no idea what they're going to do on this third down when they've got, you know, no interior pass rush and Olivier Vernon to go with JPP. I, I just, and then they signed to Norris Jenkins. Like, come on. Well, yeah, and, that, and that's the, the third piece. $200 million later, the, <laughs> the Giants have made uh, three, you know, pretty good moves. Uh, you know, the, the JPP thing, you know, all, all right, that's fine. But dude, these the, for the next five years, it's, uh, you know, they, they'd better hope that they don't need to do anything like, uh, like trade or draft a quarterback. <laughs> they probably will. Well, you could, I mean, right? Eli Manning is not... Tom Brady or Peyton Manning, I think that when he starts declining, there's not going to be far to fall before he's not useful. Do you think Ben McAdoo is just trying to secure like one more ring in the first two years so he doesn't immediately lose his job? <laughs> I think I think Ben McAdoo is going to have a lot of leeway. I think that if they suck for the next two years, they can just blame it on the quarterback, get a new one. When you get a new quarterback, you've probably got a longer lease on life. Also, the Giants, like they, they're pretty patient with coaches, right? <laughs> patient with Tom Coughlin. Yeah, so... Yeah, he might get some time. But, like, Janoris Jenkins is overrated. Um, but, he's a good corner. But he's theoretically, not. this defense could be pretty legit. I mean, you've got Janoris Jenkins and Dominique rogers Cromarty at cornerback. And now you've got a a, a fairly stout run-blocking defense. Or, okay, so uh, they signed good players. I should be Rushing defense, that. rather. Yeah, they, they, they signed good players. I mean, all, all these players are good. But are they $200 million good? And I think the right. answer is pretty they, clearly no. Yeah, they overpaid for every single one of these players, and they've got one player who's already created a redundancy on their line. <laughs> so um, they're all good players, but <sighs> the defense will go from pretty bad to all right for a lot of money. For all the money. Yeah. I think uh, I think we have to give honorable mention in the ridiculous – contract category to uh the falcons for picking up uh, mohammed sanu whoa for yes 32 and a half million dollars <laughs> that was nuts and the rumor was that he was going to go for seven million a year and everyone was like well that's that's not true. there's no way well that's asinine and he very nearly did it's a <laughs> average of like six point something million 14 yeah. million guaranteed yeah jeez seven Damn. million dollar signing bonus i mean like <laughs> I guess I can't, like, it's Mohamed Sanu. He's like, and I understand they got, you know, Julio Jones. They don't really need, they don't really need, like, a great number two. But well, that's a reason get to one. underpay instead of overpay in <laughs> right? <free agency. laughs> Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, and I mean, if anything is true about Mohamed Sanu, it's that he is used to playing in the shadow of, like, other really good receivers. Yeah, from the same draft class, no less. Uh, 50 targets last season. So assuming a similar number of targets this season. Jesus. Uh, what's, uh, what's 7 million divided by 50? 350,000 per, uh, per target? <laughs> 35,000 per target. They, so they paid 6.5 million for a dude who's only hit above 600 yards once in his career, and that was for 790 yards. And I believe Marvin Jones was injured that year. But he's had 11 touchdowns in his entire career in Cincinnati. In his career? He had no (laughs) touchdowns last year. Oh, my gosh. This is terrible. This is just a terrible deal. (laughs) This reminds me of the time when the Vikings got Michael Jenkins, except they got him for like $2 million and no one was really upset. Yeah, exactly. We didn't guarantee him $14 million to run downfield and, and act like he might catch the ball. On the other hand, they may have upgraded a quarterback by signing Mohamed Sanu, so... 
<laughs> he has a perfect passer rating. Has he thrown one pass and it was caught? He has thrown five passes. They've all been caught. Ooh. Uh, two touchdowns, no interceptions. <laughs> Definitely an upgrade over Matt Ryan. <laughs> that much is that much is clear. So, in terms of teams that have made the strongest moves in free agency and the and the teams that have lost the most in free agency season thus far, I have a couple of standouts on either side. All right. I think Jacksonville has had a really amazing free agency. All right. Well, well, recap it for me so that I can react real time because I kind of forgot. <laughs> uh, Malik Jackson, I think, is the uh, is the big standout. Uh, yeah, from he's Denver. a really good player. I think they slightly overpaid for him, but they've got like eighty million dollars in cap space. They've got they've got a ton of cap space, and I think a lot of the Broncos players. I mean, I, the Broncos are going to be fielding an entirely different team next year, regrettably. And, they lost uh, six players, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and not just, you know, anybody either. Like, Danny Trevithan is gone. In fact, I have the Broncos listed as my top uh, loser in, in free agency. They lost Danny Trevithan. They lost Malik Jackson. Uh, it looks like they're going to lose C.J. Anderson. They lost Peyton Manning and Brock Osweiler. Oh, yeah, they lost No, no, uh, you know, stay, stay strong. They're going to get Colin Kaepernick. <laughs> the golden garbage can lives to fight again. <laughs> I actually, somebody mentioned on Twitter, I forget who it was. I think it might have been Iowa Josh. Uh, yes, it was. Josh Bjork uh, made a joke about how the Broncos were going to trade for Jay Cutler. And I actually would be totally okay with that. That would be way better than getting Colin Kaepernick. That would be, so, that, that might actually be awesome. I mean, if you want to talk about uh, saving Wait, Jay is Cutler. Is there anyone left in that front office who was there when Jay Cutler was traded away? No. Okay, so you don't have the same coach. You don't have the same. Well, then why would he feel upset about that? I, I mean, aside from his normal state of always upset. That's that's just the way he. Well, I, I remember Jay Cutler has transcended human emotion. <laughs> but anyway, uh, getting back to the, no, uh, the Jaguars, uh, they also have uh, Deshaun Gibson now. Oh yeah, that was a good signing. He was hurt last year. Didn't have a great year last year, but he was hurt. Uh, and the year before that, he was phenomenal. So uh, my guess is, and he actually is a pretty good fit for that defense, given the amount of range that he has uh, and their need for a safety with range. Um, and he'll play something he's a little bit more comfortable playing, something that he played closer to his 2014 year anyway. Great signing. Uh, the internet is split on this one, and uh, I am a little bit higher on it than it seems like most of the internet is. But uh, the Jaguars also picked up Chris Ivory from the Jets. Oh, it was a great signing. Why, I, know. I thought people, so too. Because he's getting like six million dollars, right? Uh, well, he's getting he's getting a lot of money, and I think the uh, the argument is that Perfect. the kind of back that Chris Ivory is leads to like shortish careers and uh, or or short peaks rather. And, There's no uh, evidence for that, by the way. Yeah, and well, uh, so people will people will say this both about big bruising backs because they take a lot of punishment and small backs. Because they don't have a body to take punishment. So there's no... <laughs> so, so, the so really the argument is that the, the position is just too punishing for anyone. Right. Ugh. Uh, but I, I think there are a lot of uh, people who are really high on TJ Yeldon. And uh, signing Chris Ivory makes it pretty clear that he's probably going to take a back seat. Well, the thing is, Ivory is probably better in short, short yardage situations than TJ Yeldon. Despite you know maybe the reputation that Alabama backs have or that TJ Yeldon has. Um, no, no, I think that, and I don't think it was a ton of money. I think it was more money than people expected the Jaguars who already have a running back to pay for a running back. But I think that, you know, Yeldon, I mean, he only had 60 yards a game last year and only had two touchdowns. He has a lot of issues in short yardage situations. Chris Ivory is like the opposite of that. And I think that if, if your two concerns are, um, and Chris Ivory hasn't even had a thousand attempts yet. Um, cause he only really started, uh, so he had one year with new Orleans where he was the primary back two years where he was not a primary back. Uh, and then three more years where he took a lion's share of the carries, but you know, only one of them where he took over 200 carries. Um, if you if your dual concerns are that they already have a running back and that, uh, he'll take up too much punishment. I think one concern solves the other concern, right? You, you would, you would think, I mean, the historically, Jacksonville has tried to be a, a one running back team. Like you have your starter, but this 
like the the Yeldon Ivory combination seems like a pretty ideal running back by committee situation. Yeah, especially after they cut Toby. I feel bad for Toby. I feel like he would have been a good running back if the Vikings ever drafted him. Um, but yeah, the uh, Jaguars are also looking at Robert Ayers and uh, Prince Amukamara to uh, to round out their suddenly much better defense. Uh, yeah, the Giants, by the way, should have just re-signed Prince Amukamara. I'm not. I don't know if that was possible. I can't read Amukamara's mind. But like, ideally. They should not have signed General Jenkins. They should have just re-signed. They could have saved almost $70 million. (laughs) Um, Again, Jenkins, good player. Just a little overpaid. Um, But yeah, no, I thought the Jaguars had a great free agency. A lot of people say that about teams that have a lot of cap space. But I don't think that any of these situations are situations where they overspent too much. Again, I think they overspent a little bit on Malik Jackson. Uh, and there's some issues with it, but I mean, he's a fast dude for a defensive tackle, um, who, which is why he sometimes plays defensive end. Um, but, um, yeah, no, uh, I think all of these, and if, especially if they pick up a Mukamara, uh, I think all of these signings are pretty good. I mean, they had a huge safety problem and I think that Deshaun Gibson is more likely than not to help solve that issue. You're not going to find that safety in this draft. <laughs> so I just... Uh, glancing at articles, I see that uh, Russell Okung is still a free agent. Huh. And yeah, and he uh, he fired his agent and is representing himself. Yeah, I did. I did hear that he was representing himself. So he is scheduled personally visits with two teams. I don't know who though. Uh, the Lions and the Giants. Oh. So so do you think he can get himself more or less money in negotiating with the Giants than if he had an agent, or is there even any way to know? Well, I, there's. Probably not a way to know. So the problem is agent fees first. And the second is if he can get more money uh, than like whatever, like 10% or whatever uh, over that than agent fees. So that's that'll be interesting um, to see the money that he ends up getting. Um, we, we never know. I mean, wh- who's the last? Ed Reed negotiated for himself, right? Um but he didn't get a bunch of money, and then he was cut. So it's not as if we had a good litmus test for like a star. Not that Russell Okung is a star anymore. Um, anymore. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it'd be interesting. We can guess. We'll speculate that the final contract numbers won't be as good. But you know, maybe with agent fees and all that other crap, maybe it sort of evens out if he hitches his wagon to the giant star i say anything is possible he could exactly yeah i think that with the giants i think you could he could be taking golden showers any day now <laughs> what well it's it's a bad reference because golden tate is no longer with the seahawks he's with the lions and if he's signed with the lions he could have golden come on oh oh basic. yeah no no then he would be taking showers with golden <laughs> oh okay good point uh, my other big free agency winner so far is uh, the Oakland Raiders, and they're uh, somewhat more. They've oh, they've just had they, a bunch of really high profile big. signings. Yeah, we complimented them for their last two drafts, I think, uh, and that's turned out well for them. Uh, Cleo Mack and Gabe Jackson and Derek Carr and Amari Cooper, great stuff in their drafts. Uh, and I thought they had a, a really good free agency too. I think you're right. Sean Smith, Kalechi Osamele, Bruce Irvin, uh, still in the hunt for Eric Weddle. Could potentially like yeah. they're they're definitely a team on the rise. Yeah, it sounds like they may be able to get uh, Eric Weddle, but yeah, pairing Bruce Irvin with Cleo Mack, that's going to be great uh, for their exterior pass rush. Uh, Sean Smith, I'm actually a little bit torn on in terms of his overall value, um, but I think that given the state of the Raiders secondary, uh, he's definitely a huge upgrade. So um, you know, unless like who is it, DJ Hayden? Unless like he stops dying on the field. Uh, um, I think you can only do that once. Well, he's gotten pretty close a couple of times. Like <laughs> he's he's pushing the envelope. Well, he's got like he's got like a heart problem. Like he's got like a he almost did die on the field when he was playing for Houston. So and then he had and then he got injured like twice in Oakland. I don't know, man. That dude should probably not play football. But when he does play football, he's not bad. Uh, um, so. <laughs> So yeah, no, the, he's a uh, no. I think Sean Smith is a is a good pickup. I'm a little torn on how good necessarily he is, um, but certainly it's an upgrade for Oakland. Obviously, Cletus Samelli, 
great. I kind of wouldn't want him playing left tackle. I know a lot of Vikings fans were like, oh, he could play left tackle you know, instead of Matt Khalil. Uh, and he's played left tackle and he's played it ably for the Ravens. But I think overall he's actually not as good of a left tackle. He's he's goodish at left tackle, better probably than Matt Khalil. Um, but he's a great guard. Uh, and so they're going to have probably have Gabe Jackson on the right side and, and him on the left side. I know what the, I don't know what they're going to do about center because they're not keeping Stefan Wisniewski and I'm not super up to date on the Raiders. Um, they need a left tackle and I think they're probably going to re-sign Donald Penn for one more year. I know a bunch of Raiders fans who kind of disagree with me and they would have a better beat on that. So who knows? Um, but for the most part, you know, you know, Derek Carr struggled down the stretch and part of that has to do with the increased amount of pressure they had in the second half of the season you can solve that problem, you've got a, a, a pretty good offense that that can run really quickly, um, and you know Derek Carr can sort of exhibit the the stuff that he's best at. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got Bruce Irvin and Khalil Mack rushing, um, and uh, and for the most part, you should have a pretty good pass rush. Secondary is still an issue, um, but you know Sean Smith is there that's going to uh, you know bolster things. So yeah, I thought they had a really good offseason. Uh, any other teams that you think have had outstanding free agencies thus far? Uh, not to not to put you on the spot. It seems like it's been kind of back and forth ish. I mean, to me, Jacksonville stands out head and shoulders above the rest. And then there's some teams that have made like one or two. Well, uh, Jacksonville and Oakland. And then there's a bunch of teams that have made like one so, or two acquisitions. Well, one team I kind of want to talk about is Philadelphia. Oh yeah, I I want to hear your thoughts on what the what the Eagles are doing. So I think that you could say that Philadelphia has made the best moves of the offseason so far, except for the fact that they signed Sam Bradford or re-signed Sam Bradford to that contract. And I think Why did they do that's, that? That's like a. It's, it's a, do they just think that they don't have a chance at Fitzpatrick or Kaepernick, or do they just not want those guys? Like what? Well, okay, so I will say this. Uh, Kian Faye, who uh, is a good follow on Twitter, he released a quarterback book. It's an excellent quarterback book. I agree uh, with almost everything written in there. Uh, you know, the stuff that he wrote about Osweiler, uh, it, you know, helped develop my opinion of him. You know, Joe Flacco, Teddy Bridgewater, Derek Carr, um, Peyton Manning. Uh, he's got a bunch of really good stuff in there. The stuff that he has about Sam Bradford, and, and he's watched a lot more, and he's done a lot more thinking about each individual throw. Uh, than I have about Sam Bradford. And he thinks that Sam Bradford could be, potentially, when he's healthy, a top-10 quarterback. Uh, kind of the same thing, basically, that Chip Kelly was thinking uh, when he got Sam Bradford, um, is that when he's healthy, he's he's quite good. And a lot of people thought that right before the Eagles got him, too. So um, there is an undercurrent of this thought. I disagree with all of them. I think that Sam Bradford is not that great, and that obviously he can't stay very healthy anyway. Um, but he signs this contract, and... In fairness, now that we have seen this Brock Osweiler contract, it looks like a bargain. Um, but he signs this contract that you know in it has a cap hit of twelve and a half million this year, twenty two and a half million next year, um, and uh, and this ca- this cap hit this year is not that bad if for a quarterback. But you know, it just I don't want to be committed to this guy. They signed a backup quarterback to Chase Daniel, who for, uh, relatively expensive for a backup quarterback contract. Um, and it's probably going to preclude them from drafting a quarterback because they've got so much money invested in, in these two guys. Uh, and I think that's going to be a problem. But if you take a look at the rest of this free agency, and I know how important quarterbacks are, uh, so it's very difficult to say this, it might have been worth it to get the rest of this this offseason because they were able to trade Byron Maxwell and Kiko Alonso away on the same day um, and DeMarco Murray, and they were able to – they got like – Got a bunch of draft picks out of it. They moved up from thirteen to eight, uh, and um, I think they got like an additional fourth round pick, and um, they got they got a lot of assets, and um, and that was just that was all good. It was all it was all it was all really good stuff, you know. Uh, you know some of the trades, and I think they made some signings and re-signings that I I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, but you know, there's some good stuff that they did so far this off season. Well, on to the bad then. I think Denver far and away is, uh, is suffering the most in this free agency. This will be a, a true test of John Elway's GM slash executive VP of operations capabilities when, uh, when he has to be more strategic than just 
find Peyton Manning and have him win you a Super Bowl. Right. Which is, you know, a so bit of an so, oversimplification, but still, right. I mean, our, we're, it, it's not good <laughs> thus far, but, uh, uh, I guess moving a little what? further down, like, I mean, they're, they're head and shoulders the worst, but I think the Jets they're the, are... They're the worst, but also one of the things that made their defense so good was the amount of depth they had. So I think this hurts them less than it looks like on paper once you take into account that, you know, Sylvester Williams isn't bad. They do need to find another tackle slash end to replace Malik Jackson. But for the most part, you know, the defense will be largely okay Obviously, you have to find a quarterback that's going to be a first-round thing. You have to find a running back that might be a third-round thing. But their quarterback situation was never great anyway. So it's bad. I think you're right that it's the worst. It's just it, I think it looks worse than it is. Yeah, and it's – I mean, at least they are out from under Manning's contract. I mean, yeah. they're, they they have to pay Von Miller at some point, so that's going to be a, uh, a concern for them, I think. But, I mean, is there – is there that much talent at the? I mean, we're we're looking at trading for Colin Kaepernick. Really, I think, uh, and I don't really necessarily know what Kubiak wants in a quarterback uh, because he's worked with so many different styles of quarterbacks. Um, you know, he's worked with like Matt Schaub and Joe Flacco, and you know, on and on. Um, but um, yeah, I think that you know you, you, they can find a quarterback that'll fit their style. I think that if they got Jared Goff, for example. Would be difficult, you know, with like the thirty-first pick or whatever. Um, but you know, one one of these quarterbacks is probably going to fall to the second round, which means it's going to fall to pick thirty-one. Uh, and I think that they could find a quarterback that would be better than getting Colin Kaepernick. Um, but if they trade for him, that's a thing they did. <laughs> or uh, or Ryan Fitzpatrick, maybe I would be I would be happier if they traded for Fitzpatrick. I would be happier if they traded for Fitzpatrick if Demarius Thomas was better at contested catches. Fitzpatrick throws a lot of those. Touché. Marshall and Decker are very good at winning them. Um, so that's... Mm. Well, Emmanuel Sanders is a, is, is a largest guy. But no, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, I actually think the Jets are in rough shape when they basically got rid of Chris Ivory and picked up Matt Forte. Yeah, I would have uh, kept Ivory. I mean, I know mm. Forte has been really great, but like... Ivory isn't like 80, so. <laughs> well, right. And Ivory was like one of the, well, everybody was surprised by two players on the Jets, it seemed like, last year. Ryan Fitzpatrick is because he managed to not fall apart. And right. Chris Ivory because he looked like he could breathe some life into the franchise. Exactly. And now one's uh, gone and, and the other's about to go. Yeah, and they and they lost Damon Harrison, uh, which I don't know if I would use the word sucks, but is, you know, <laughs> it would have been better not to lose him. Uh, he was worth like the eight and a half million or eight million dollars that he signed for with the Giants. Uh, and so, you know, it would have been would have been nice to keep him. The only reason I'm saying it doesn't suck is because <clears throat> I think they franchised Muhammad Wilkerson. So they get to keep Leonard Williams, Sheldon Richardson and Muhammad Wilkerson on the same line. So that's not that big of an issue for them. But still, Snacks was good. Uh, I also think that the Saints were just like a, a head scratcher in their like random desire to seek out Kobe Fleener. The Saints have been pretty random about their off seasons for the last two years. So, yeah, I I mean I agree with you. I, Kobe Fleener, man, the whole <laughs> reason they drafted him uh, in in Indianapolis is because he was you know he was supposed to have this chemistry with Andrew Luck because he was Luck's favorite target at Stanford. Yeah, big pass catching tight end. It's supposed to be like the 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 second coming of Gronk, right? Well, if people were saying that then I mean that that was ne- that was like always a bit of a stretch. I mean like a like a second banana to Gronk I think would have been right. more accurate, but uh, but you know, still uh somebody who would see, you know, a lot of targets from Andrew Luck while well, we all saw how that worked out. Right. And he's it, insanely athletic for a tight end. I mean, he's pretty light for a tight end, 250 pounds, but he ran a four, five, two, uh, you know, he had a seven second, three cone, a 37 inch vert, um, really, really athletic, but he's just not a good player. So <laughs> he's just not good at the football. So, yeah. Um, 
I mean, there's a reason they 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 paid Dwayne Allen, and I'm not one to defend Grigson, but there's a reason they paid Dwayne Allen over Kobe Fleener. Um, so, yeah, that was weird. Um, I think you know the biggest issue in free agency has to be the Browns. There's no question, right? They lose Alex Mack. They lose Mitchell Schwartz. They lose Travis Benjamin. They lose to Sean Gibson. Ooh, yeah, that's none of that is good. And plus, they have to figure out who they're going to replace Johnny Manziel with. Yeah, they're they're about to quote unquote lose, uh, quote unquote starting quarterback. They they have to figure out the quarterback situation. Um, and then not only that, the the players that they went after, they kind of went after Mitchell Schwartz and then like retracted their offer. I don't know what that's about. I kind of want to hear more about it. But they tried to get Marvin Jones, they couldn't get him, right? Um, and you know, I think they tried to go after someone else, they couldn't get him. Did you mention um, Johnson Batamosi? Because he's gone too now. Oh, yeah, that's a loss. I didn't list him. That's a loss, but it's not a huge loss. But still, they, they're starting to pile on at this point. Yeah. Five yeah, players yeah. in free agency that's and then losing their quarterback because he can't keep it together. I mean, that's they're going to have an uphill climb. Not that the Browns ever don't, but... Right. The, the worst, I think... Well, maybe it's not the worst. I think losing all the players is the worst. But the salt in the wound was when Adam Schefter went on ESPN and said... Players treat the Browns like it's college. Four years and they're out. Oh. Ouch. It was, just, it was, yeah, it was brutal. Oh, that's Cleveland for you. And in my head, I have the, uh, the, the image of the, uh, the Cleveland quarterback jersey with all the names crossed out. <laughs> Except now it's a depth chart. <laughs> now it's all positions. You could, you could put on literally any player's jersey from five years ago. And there's probably four more names you could put on it. Yep. Well, there you go. So, uh, yeah, Browns, uh, Broncos, and then to a lesser extent, the the Jets and the Saints. Although I, I'm not that concerned about the Saints going forward. It seems like they are focused on a strong draft. So maybe, maybe, maybe they have a master plan when it's pretty clear that Denver doesn't really have a plan yet. And Cleveland, who knows? That's a pretty good way to sum up Cleveland. And, you know, I always feel bad for the coach because sometimes they make some coaching hires that I strongly approve of. <coughs> Hugh Jackson strongly approved of. Mike Patin, when they hired him, I strongly approved of that, especially because he was like their 60th option, right? Because a bunch of coaches just turned down their interviews with them or they, uh, or they became coaches somewhere else. Uh, they gave Mike Patin. I thought that was a great option. Maybe I was wrong about that. A lot of people didn't actually end up liking him. So whatever. But, I mean... You have to work with this front office. You have to work with this executive staff. You have to work with like owners who not only commit felonies but also like lose draft picks and get fined because they like text people on the sidelines and shit. Um, like <laughs> as a coach, come on, man, that right. sucks. Yeah. All right. Well, shall we mailbag? Yeah, we got a we got it. a couple of questions that were not answered in the the context of the show that are worth going over. Uh, first from Daniel P at Person Daniel on Twitter: If Matt Asiata signs with the Packers, will you call him Matt Asiago? I think I've heard this question eighty times, so I'm not answering it. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> uh, Sean Smith at Elden Romani on Twitter writes us. Given the temporary solution with Griffin at safety, do you think this causes Spielman to wait until mid to late rounds to draft one? Sorry, you cut out for me. Could you do that again? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, given the temporary solution with Mike Griffin at safety, do you think this causes Spielman to wait until mid to late rounds to draft one? Uh, no, I think that the Vikings are going to go into the draft uh, targeting a couple of safeties. And I think that the only instance where they don't target a safety on day two is if the ones that they value as day two picks are off the board. So I think that it's definitely in play in round two or three to, to draft a safety. I don't think the Michael Griffin thing or the Andrew Sandejo thing um, prevent that from happening or even approximately change its odds too much. He also writes, do you think we sign an offensive tackle? Seems to be a priority at the moment. Uh, I mean, they're bringing one in for a visit. I think that they're going to sign a backup offensive tackle. I don't think they're going to sign Andre Smith. I don't think they're going to sign uh, somebody who would be a presumptive favorite to win a starting spot at offensive tackle. 
Uh, AJ Marco at AJ Marco 65 writes us, what's Boone's best punch? Hook, jab, or uppercut? <laughs> well, my guess is if you're guaranteed contact, it would be it would be the, the uppercut. But I think that I think that all things aside, it's probably a hook. Uh, the obvious answer is none of the above. It is obviously a headbutt. Okay, fair enough. We we just wanted to know for Clay Matthews purposes. Whether well, whether or not well, I, I think if it was if he was in a boxing match, I think his best punch would still be a headbutt, and he would wait <laughs> until the referee's back was turned, or until he was briefly distracted before stepping in for a a vicious strike. You're right. Uh, boxing is just like wrestling. He's already been practicing it. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Thaddeus Maximus at School Viking 75 writes, Will Aaron Rodgers' blood be easy to clean out of the new turf, if you were to guess? <laughs> I think they're making that a priority. Uh, I, I guess I'm hoping yes. Well, yeah, it would just not be civil not to be able to clean that out. Because, I mean, it would be an awful lot of blood otherwise, and that might be a little too intimidating to other teams. Plus, red's not even a team color. <laughs> Uh, Racer K at RacerCraft writes us, assuming a top prospect does not slip to position 23, do we take the best player available, the best wide receiver available, or trade down? I mean, I'm a huge fan of trading down. Uh, um, I think that that is the best option for the Vikings in this draft. And fans say this every year. I've said this a lot of years. Uh, you know, it, analytics analysts say this a lot. You know, the, the math favors trading down more often than it does trading up. Um, except when you consider that sort of the fifth year option potential for the contract sort of thing. Um, but I think that this year's the landscape is is a lot better for trading down than it is most years. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely favor trading down. Uh, barring that, I think that the Vikings definitely have a wide receiver in mind for the first two or three rounds. And I think round one would be a good spot uh, for that wide receiver. Um, I think that it is possible that the Vikings draft a linebacker in round one. Again, this is a conversation I mentioned maybe three, four weeks ago uh, at Crosserific. Crosser, great commenter, points out, you know, hey, the Vikings were nickel, uh, 60% of their snaps. You don't want to draft someone in round one who's only there for 40% of snaps. Still disagree uh, because you can construct a lot of ways to get 800 snaps out of three linebackers without compromising a lot of things. And people draft nose tackles all the time. Uh, in in the first round. So um, I think it's definitely possible they draft a linebacker. I think it's more likely they do that in the second round than the first round, but it's definitely possible. And hey, you might draft another developmental tackle that could happen in the first round playing behind Matt Khalil. Um, But I still think the most likely option is wide receiver. We did mention safety. That is still possible. You know, if they don't mind the combine that Darian Thompson put together, a lot of people like him a lot. If they like Von Bell a lot, uh, they're about to go to his pro day, uh, you know, tomorrow as of this recording. So safety is definitely in play uh, in the first round, but I think the most likely option is wide receiver. And I don't think the Vikings rarely pursue a quote unquote best player available uh, model for for drafting. Um, so I don't think, at least in the first couple of rounds, uh, and I don't mind that. I think the best player available is a missed number. Well, uh, I was going to ask you too. Like, I mean, don't you feel like at twenty three, there's just like a lot of overlap between who the best player available would be and who the best wide receiver available would be? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there always is. Yeah. Um. So, um, I don't know. Like, this is this would be, and the most recent example of this is the Jets drafting Leonard Williams when they clearly didn't have a needed defensive end. Um, because they had Sheldon Richardson and Muhammad Wilkerson. Um, it allowed them to let Damon Harrison walk, but, you know, whatever. They had to franchise Wilkerson to keep him anyway. Um, but um, I, don't th- I don't think it increases your likelihood of winning to draft a player at a, at a position of strength. So, uh, And I think that there's probably enough players at positions of need that are pretty good they should draft anyway. Because most people, when they say, when they find examples of players drafted, you know, quote unquote, for need uh, that didn't work out, they're not saying that was a bad value. They're saying that that was a bad player. And that's just a misevaluation problem. That's not a vindication for or against a strategy. A lot of great teams draft, you know, quote unquote, for need. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that 
they think that if a player isn't good enough to warrant their value at a position of need, I think that you're better off trading down anyway. So whatever. Um, so yeah, uh, one person said we shouldn't think about it in terms of best player available. Um, because I mean, a lot of teams, actually no team drafts best player available because most teams only have draft boards of like 75 players because they get rid of players because they don't meet, they don't meet the criteria they need for the, for the way that they play their positions. Uh, and so a really good player might be a fifth round pick in their system when he's a first round pick in someone else's system and they'll acknowledge that. Uh, and so no team actually drafts the best player available. They say that. They say they'll draft the best player available um, because saying, you know, position of need diminishes the players that you have on your roster anyway. Uh, and um, it's saying that you didn't draft the best guy to a guy you just drafted. So um, they'll say they draft the best player available, but they really don't. And they explicitly do not because they get rid of really good players, players that they think are really good that do not fit. Uh, their system of their requirements. So someone said that the best way to think about this is not position of need or best player available, but instead, because otherwise you'd be like drafting punters in the first round or something, uh, but instead um, biggest impact available. And impact is a combination of snaps that you can take. So that's kind of need uh, and how how well you play. And it allows you to create the sliding scale because if you're really good, but you're only in a position of slight need, it might be better than someone who is pretty good but at a position of major need, and therefore you'd be a bigger impact despite not being at a position of need and despite not being the best player available. So that might be it. But I think the Vikings generally have models for drafting that do not take the best player available, but they will take you know the best linebacker available in the late rounds, the best guard available in the late rounds or something. But for the most part, the first couple of rounds they've drafted for need. Well, and the implication is that, you know, if you if you don't draft the best player available, then there's something wrong with the system that you're using to draft. Like, oh, there's this guy that would have been better, but we chose not to draft him. Like, that, that's silly. Yeah. Um, that and, like, there's, like, this weird thing. Like, you've... A lot of teams rank players... Uh, or not rank... They're, a lot of teams don't rank players. They have horizontal draft boards um, instead of vertical ones. Um, but... A lot of teams look at players that there's like small distinctions between them. And so what ends up happening is that you've got three players with the same grade. And one of those players is a better fit for your team based off of what your needs are. So you draft that one, right? And so they still are drafting the best player available. But they all had the same grade. Uh, so it's just that one was at a more important position uh, for them at that moment. Uh, so it's like weird because that's not how teams end up drafting anyway because they've got these horizontal boards um except you know some teams don't like new england doesn't but they've got a really weird system anyway so it doesn't really matter um but yeah it's uh it's silly because there's no single best player available and like the second best player if if you did that is not it's not like a lot, way a lot of people talk about is like this huge drop off like you're reaching for this sixth round linebacker because you need a linebacker in the second round that doesn't happen for teams. Like when the Vikings drafted Christian Ponder, they very probably did not have a second round grade on him. They probably had a first round grade on him. The problem wasn't that they drafted for need. The problem was that they were wrong. So, yeah, I mean, that's like, I think that that kind of thinking is 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 employing the incorrect assumptions about the way teams draft and the way that teams rank or grade players. So maybe we can put that nonsense to bed. Uh, we'll before. never, we'll never put that nonsense to bed. It's well, a debate every single year, and it annoys me every single year. <laughs> I know you certainly sound happy to have it now. Uh, <laughs> speaking of putting nonsense to bed, that is the end of the mailbag, and consequently, the end of this episode of Norse Code. All right. Womp womp. Womp womp. Uh, next week, we will have Bleacher Reports NFL Draft lead writer Matt Miller as our guest. So that'll be something to look forward to. Yeah, at NFL Drafts Cap. Um, if you're really curious about stuff, pre write your questions and email them in uh, at, what is it, NorseCodePodcast at gmail.com? You are correct. We will, yeah, uh, sure. we will apply the mailbag for questions for Matt and, uh, and for a reef. And that, uh, that'll be taped next Thursday night. So you've got one calendar week to, uh, 
to submit your questions. You can also do so on Twitter. Tweet us at NorseCodeDN. That account is run by our producer, James Pogachnik, who is at Big Mono on Twitter. You can follow me at Dusty O'Connell and Arif, of course, at Arif Hassan NFL. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash Daily Norseman. Um, we've been doing a pretty good job of including more content as the week goes by. In fact, it was pretty funny. I managed to basically publish some stuff that pretty much ended in the show notes or publish some stuff that you guys talked about on uh, last week's show in the run-up to the show on Facebook without coordinating with you at all. So that was convenient. Hooray! You can also check out uh, dailynorseman.com. We host all of the episodes there, as well as our website, norsecodepodcast.com. Uh, on our website, you can click on the little PayPal donate link to throw us a couple bucks if you feel like our service is worth paying for. But what we would really like is if you became a recurring sponsor of the show on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash norsecode. You can contribute any amount you like, $1 to, I don't know, let's say $1,000, $1,000 a month. Not, not that, you know, anyone anyone would but if you did that would be great but you but you definitely shouldn't prevent yourself from contributing a thousand dollars a month if you were thinking about it and then were dissuaded by dusty saying maybe you wouldn't if you can then you should let me let me put it that way we if you really can and have an inkling of wanting to i don't want to put like this normative statement on people no i, th- I think if you are if you are capable like if you are in, in a position in your life where where you can afford to uh to commit a thousand dollars a month to the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings, then that goes from just a uh, uh, a desirous thing to a moral obligation. <laughs> All right, Dusty, I won't argue with you on that because <laughs> it would be it would be great, wouldn't it? But uh, seriously, check out our Patreon, become a, a recurring contributor, and we will be eternally grateful and also able to provide you with uh, better equipment to produce the podcast and. Uh, better tools for analysis so that we can seem more informed as we perform this show for you. So uh, with all of that in mind, that's going to do it for episode 123 of Norse Code. We will see you next week with guest Matt Miller. And until then, our formula is this. Keep Teddy alive. Norse Code is the official podcast of the Daily Norseman SB Nation blog and is produced with cooperation from Pompous Jerk Productions. Pompous Jerk Productions.